Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. But Jesus said unto them, With God all things are possible. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. Out of a shining jewel case of luminous texts on the omnipotence of God, and there are many, I have chosen four. To Abraham, then called Abram, God said, I am the Almighty God. Our Lord Jesus said positively, With God all things are possible. And the angel who appeared to Mary turned it around and said it negatively, With God nothing shall be impossible. Finally we hear the voice of the great multitude, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. I suppose the first thing to do would be to define omnipotence. It comes, of course, from omni, meaning all, and potent, meaning able to do and to have power. And so omnipotent means able to do all and to have all power. It means having all the potency there is. Then we come to a second word, almighty, which is also in one of these scripture passages. Now that means exactly the same thing as omnipotent, only it is from the Anglo-Saxon, while omnipotent is from the Latin. In the Bible, the word Almighty is used fifty-six times and is never used about anyone else but God. In our English Bible, the word omnipotent is only used once, and it refers to God. And there's a reason for this. Almighty means having an infinite and absolute plentitude of power. When you use the words infinite and absolute, you can only be talking about one person, God. There is only one infinite being, because infinite means without limit. And it is impossible that there should be two beings in the universe without limit. So, if there is only one, you are referring to God. Even philosophy and human reason, as little as I think of it, has to admit this. I read a review of a book of mine the other day written by a doctor of philosophy. He was in favor of it, but not wholly so. He said that I was against scholarship, which I am not. I am just against big windbags, that's all. I am against fellows whose heads are inflated. I am not against a real scholar such as Augustine or Paul or Luther or Wesley. But I am against men who think they're scholars. But even reason has to kneel down and declare that God is omnipotent. If you think you don't know a thing except by reason, you don't have knowledge. If you have knowledge by revelation, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21, then you have it. But once you have it by revelation, then reason sometimes is forced to kneel down and say, The Lord God omnipotent reigneth, and admit that it's true. So I give you three propositions briefly here. 1. God has power. Proposition number one is that God has power. Of course, everybody knows that. David said, God hath spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Psalm 62, verse 11. And the man Paul, one of the greatest intellects that the world ever knew, said this, For the invisible things of him, God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. You look up at the starry heavens above and see the eternal power of God there. God's power and Godhead are found there. We used to sing a song which they still sing in some places, the spacious firmament on high with all the blue ethereal sky and spangled heavens a shining frame their great original proclaim. The unwearied sun from day to day does his creator's power display and publishes to every land the work of an almighty hand. Soon as the evening shades prevail, the moon takes up the wondrous tale, and nightly to the listening earth repeats the story of her birth, whilst all the stars that round her burn, 
and all the planets in their turn confirm the tidings as they roll and spread the truth from pole to pole. In reason's ear they all rejoice and utter forth a glorious voice, forever singing as they shine, The hand that made us is divine. God has power, and whatever God has is without limit, therefore God is omnipotent. God is absolute, and whatever touches God or whatever God touches is absolute, therefore God's power is infinite. God is almighty. 2. God is the source of all power. Proposition number two is that God is the source of all the power there is. There isn't any power anywhere that doesn't have God as its source, whether it be the power of the intellect, of the spirit, of the soul, of dynamite, of the storm, or of magnetic attraction. Wherever there is any power at all, God is the author of it, and the source of anything has to be greater than that which flows out of it. If you pour a quart of milk out of a can, that can has to be equal to or greater than a quart. The can has to be as big as or bigger than that which comes out of it. The can may contain several gallons, though you may pour out only a quart. The source has to be as big or bigger than that which comes out of it. So if all the power there is came from God, all the power, therefore God's power must be equal to or greater than all the power there is. 3. God gives power, but still retains it. Proposition number three is that God delegates power to his creation, but he never relinquishes anything of his essential perfection. God gives power, but he doesn't give it away. When God gives power to an archangel, he still retains that power. When God the Father gives power to the Son, he keeps that power. When God pours power upon a man, he still keeps that power. God can't give anything of himself away. God can't relinquish any of his power because if he did, he would be less powerful than he was before. And if he were less powerful than he was before, he would not be perfect, for perfection means that he has all power. God can't give away his power. A battery only has so much power in it, and if that is slowly given away, the battery gets weaker and weaker. You found that out on a cold morning sometimes when you go out to the car, turn the key, and there's a discouraged moan, but the thing won't turn over. You trusted your battery, and your battery failed you. It used up its power. It has given it away, so that little by little it has become less than it was before. But when God gives power to angels, archangels, redeemed men, mountains, seas, stars, and planets, He doesn't relinquish anything. He doesn't become less than He was before. God's batteries do not run down. Everything comes out from God and returns to God again. The great God Almighty, the Lord God Omnipotent, reigneth. He has now the same amount of power that He had when He made the heaven and the earth and called the stars into being. He will never have any less power than He has now, nor will He ever have any more, since He has all the power there is. That is the God we serve. Therefore I cannot for the life of me see any reason in the world why anyone should be fearful and timid, saying, I'm afraid I can't make it. I'm afraid God can't keep me. God can keep the stars in their courses and the planets in their orbits. God can keep all His vast display of might everywhere throughout His universe. Surely God can keep you. It's like a fly perched on a seat in an airplane, moaning and trembling for fear that the plane can't carry its weight. That plane weighs several tons, and it has several tons of people and baggage on it. That fly is so light that it's impossible, outside of a laboratory, to even weigh the little guy. And yet we can imagine him sitting there flapping his little wings and saying, I'm just afraid this plane won't hold me up. The great God Almighty stretches forth his broad wings and moves upon the wind. God will hold you up. He'll keep you if you turn yourself over to him. He'll hold you when nothing else can. Nothing will be able to destroy you. God contains, perpetuates, and sustains all things. He is upholding all things by the word of His power. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It is God that holds all things together. Do you ever wonder why you don't cave in from 14 pounds of air pressure on every square inch of your body? 
Have you ever wondered why you don't blow up from internal pressure? Because the great God Almighty has spoken His power into His universe and everything runs according to that power. You may be thinking, it's all well and good to say that God has all the power in the universe, but what about the laws of nature? Well, let's look at that phrase, the laws of nature. What is a law, anyway? The word has at least two meanings. The first meaning is an external rule imposed by an authority. If you don't think so, try parking by a fire hydrant sometime and go whistling off to do your business. When you come back, you'll go whistling off to pick up your car at the impound lot. It's a law imposed by an authority, the same as the laws against murder, assault, and robbery. I wonder what they do with all the laws they crank out in our legislatures. Thank God we don't know even one-tenth of them, or we would die worrying about it. Anyway, those are laws imposed by an authority from the outside. You either do it or else, and the or else part is a fine or jail time or something else. That's one kind of law. Then there's another way the word law is used, by scientists, philosophers, and the general public. But it's not properly a law. It's the path God's power and wisdom take through creation. That's what we call the laws of nature. It's the way things are. An eagle lays an egg and it hatches into an eagle instead of a mud turtle or a frog. We call that a law of nature. But nobody passed that law in any parliament or congress. It's just the way it is. It's phenomenon rather than law. It's just the way God's power runs through His creation. God moves through His universe, a free God moving through His creation, and the path He takes we call the laws of nature. That's the way God works. Scientists study these phenomena, and all science is based upon them, of course. There are two things all scientists know, and one is the uniformity of these phenomena. They never change from year to year, century to century, millennium to millennium. They're always the same. God always acts the same way all the time. And that's one reason I can sleep at night. I serve a God who is always the same and acts according to Himself with uniformity, always. He takes the same path through the universe at all times. The resultant ability to predict that path is what scientists call the laws of nature. It is why we can have such things as navigation and engineering. I heard of a sailor that was put in charge of steering the ship and was told by the navigator, Now you keep that star yonder just a little off the port bow. A couple of hours later the officer came back and discovered that they were way off course, so he said to the sailor, I told you to keep the star off the port bow. And he responded, Oh, we passed that star a long time ago. Of course, this story is funny only because the navigator can depend on the star staying in a fixed point in space. The acts of God are uniform. Suppose that God were whimsical, and the sun came up in the east on Wednesday, but on Thursday morning it came up in the south, and on Saturday in the north. We would say, What happened to the world? Has the world gone drunk? The sun is rising and setting opposite to what it usually does. But you don't need to worry about that. God doesn't work that way. The great God who made heaven and earth works according to uniform laws or phenomena. He always takes the same path through his universe. You can always predict where God will be and always know how it is with God. That's why the word of God stands secure. When you meet certain conditions, you can always be sure that there will be certain results because God is always taking that path through his Bible, always going by the same road through the scriptures. Always. God never backtracks or detours, but always goes the same way all the time. When God makes a promise, God keeps that promise. If the promise is over here and you're over there, it will be a dead promise, but if you come over to where it is, it will be a live promise. If God makes a promise and puts on it, and you don't meet the conditions but plead the promise, nothing will happen. You can pray for a lifetime and nothing will happen. But if you meet the conditions and go where God is, you'll find God right there all the time. That's the way it works. That's why you can have faith in God and know absolutely that God is there. Engineering, astronomy, chemistry, navigation, and all other fields of study are possible only because the laws of nature, the phenomena, are always predictable and uniform. One kind of scientist studies these phenomena and calls it pure science. He doesn't care what you do with the phenomena once he discovers them. 
Then along comes the applied scientist, who takes the work of the pure scientist and applies it to make a bomb to blow up a city, or an engine to run a ship. It doesn't make any difference to the pure scientist. That is, objectively, he should not care. He's simply finding out where God moves through his universe. He may not always call it God. I suppose usually he doesn't. But we who are God's children say that's the way God works. That's the way he does things in his universe. Religion goes beyond science, further in and further on, and says, I'm not stopping with the laws of nature, the path of God through his material universe. I'm going back to God himself, back to the source of it all, the cause of it all, to the master of these phenomena. And so Christ, by the Holy Ghost, takes us back. Powerful yet personal. We need to remember, of course, that when we think of that vast mysterium tremendum, that mysterious wonder that fills this universe, and all the other big words that philosophers use to describe God Almighty, he is the same God who called himself, I am that I am, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And his Son taught us to call him, Our Father which art in heaven, Luke chapter 11, verse 2. A king sits on a throne, inhabits a palace, wears a crown and a robe, and they call him your majesty. But when his little children see him, they run to him and yell, Daddy. I remember when the present Queen Elizabeth was growing up. I've followed her life since she was a wee little tot. One time when she was walking about the palace with her dignified but kindly old grandfather, George V, the old king left the door open. Little Elizabeth turned to him and said, Grandpa, go close that door and the great king of England went and closed the door at the voice of a little girl. He couldn't pull any of that Your Majesty business on little Elizabeth. She was just his granddaughter. And so, no matter what awful terms the philosophers want to apply to the power that rules this universe, you and I can say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Chapter 11, verse 2. We can get intimate with God, and God loves it. The old dignified king smiled and closed the door. God Almighty is like that. He loves to have his people know that in spite of his greatness, his omnipotence, and his power, he still said, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven. Chapter 11, verse 2. He's a father to the fatherless, a husband to the widow. He knows all our troubles. This great and mighty God who fills heaven and earth will... Make all our bed in our sickness. Psalm 41, verse 3. Who is it that makes the bed, smooths the sheet, turns the pillow to keep it cool, and give you life when you're sick? It's God who does it, if you only knew it. He is the God who told us to call him our Father. And God joyfully calls himself this. God set the moon up there and set the sun down yonder. In between the two he made the earth and spangled the heavens with the stars. God made all this. But we go back behind the laws of nature, behind science, behind matter, back to God himself. Christianity calls you to the knowledge of this God himself. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John chapter 17 verse 3. You can know God Himself. Salvation means the knowledge of God Himself. I happen to be a lover of Beethoven. I don't know Beethoven, but I know Beethoven's works somewhat. It would have been much better, I suppose, to know the man himself. They say he was a pretty tough customer, but he was a genius, towering above the geniuses of generations. It would have been wonderful to know him. I just listened today while we had our dinner to a sonata by Beethoven, and it was beautiful. But I suppose it would have been more wonderful if I could have shaken hands with the great Beethoven and said, It's an honor to shake your hand, sir. I consider you one of the greatest composers that ever lived. A genius. He'd have shaken his great head and walked away. But I would have told my children and grandchildren that I shook hands with Beethoven. It would have been wonderful. And so with Michelangelo, the greatest artist of his day. If only I could have shaken hands with him, eaten with him, and talked with him. Perhaps he would have called me by my first name, and I could have called him by his first name. I would introduce him to my friends and say, I'd like to have you meet the great Michelangelo. That would have been better than knowing his works. I have seen his tremendous sculpture of Moses, 
but it would have been better if I could have seen the man himself. So let men turn their telescopes on the heavens and their microscopes on the molecules. Let them probe and search and tabulate and name and find and discover. I can dare to say to them, I know the one who made all this. I'm personally acquainted with the one who made it. They may respond, but what about the Milky Way galaxy? Don't you know what it is? Yes, I know what it is. It's great clusters of stars so far away that all you can see is a blur, like looking at the lights of a city a long way off. I know the one who put the Milky Way there. I know the one who put the ocean where it is and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. Job chapter 38 verse 11. The ocean has never dared move out of its banks. We know God for himself, God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. That's why I can't understand why the gospel churches in our day are such a bunch of playing children. Jesus said to such as we are, You're like children playing in the marketplace. First you decide to play funeral, and you all sit around and cry. We walk by paying no attention to you, and you don't like it because we don't cry with you. Then you decide to play dance, so you pipe a tune. We're busy, and we don't pay attention to you. Then you get mad because we don't stop and dance. We're grown-ups. We're serious-minded people. We've got things to do, and we can't stop to play church or play funeral or play dance with you every time you get a notion. So said Jesus, in effect, to the people of his day. See Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 through 17. The gospel churches over the last fifty years have become progressively worse. More and more like children in the marketplace, they want to dance one day, play funeral another day, and play church the next. I refuse to play church. I believe in the great God Almighty who made the universe, who has called me and whom I dare to call my own. He has dinged to say that we are accepted in the Beloved, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. He has stooped to say that we're his children. They used to say about a certain automobile that it was bigger inside than outside. I believe that all of God's children ought to be infinitely bigger inside than outside. I think that you and I ought to live high up yonder. Someone told me the other night after a service that he was on cloud nine. Well, that's where we belong. Our feet ought to be on the earth. We ought to have a good hard core of earthly reality in us. But we shouldn't stay down here and play in the marketplace. We ought to search for the power of God and the cleansing blood of the Lamb, to get to know the great God Almighty. Is anything too hard for God? What does it mean to us that God Almighty has all the power there is? It means that since God has the ability always to do anything He wills to do, then nothing is harder or easier with God. Hard and easy can't apply to God because God has all the power there is. Hard or easy applies to me. Suppose I have 100 units of power. You set a task for me that uses 25 units and I've got 75 left. That's not hard. Set a task for me that uses 50 units and I have 50 left. I can still do it, but I don't like it. Set a task for me that uses 75 and I'm straining. Set a task for me that uses 95 and I have only got five units left. I'm ready to go to bed and rest up. But is God limited to so many units so that God uses up his power? Did God make the world and then fall exhausted and say, that took everything out of me? What kind of silly talk is that? As if anything could take anything out of God. God, who has all the power there is, can make a sun and a star and a galaxy as easily as he can lift a robin off a nest. God can do anything as easily as he can do anything else. This truth applies specifically to the area of our unbelief. We hesitate to ask God to do hard things because we figure that God can't do them. But if they are easy things, we ask God to do them. If we have a headache, we say, Oh God, heal my headache. But if we have a heart condition, we don't ask the Lord about that because that's too hard for the Lord. What a shame. Nothing is hard for God, nothing whatsoever. Nothing. In all God's wisdom and power, He is able to do anything as easily as He is able to do anything else. A man told me one time that he had two diseases, one critical, possibly fatal, and the other merely chronic. So he went and was prayed over for healing. 
And, now this sounds silly and rather humorous, but it actually happened, he said to me, Do you know what happened? I was healed of the dangerous one, but I still have the other one. He couldn't somehow believe that God could heal the chronic disease. Oh, God, I've had it too long. Even you can't do it. That's no way to look at God. God can do anything, anything at all. You may say, oh, if you knew how tangled up my life is. God can untangle your life just as easily as he can do anything else, because he has all the power there is and all the wisdom there is. There was a Presbyterian preacher by the name of Albert B. Simpson, a Canadian from Prince Edward Island. He was one of the great orators of his time. People came from everywhere to hear this man pour out his eloquence. But when he was only in his mid-thirties, he began to get sicker and sicker until, he said, Many a time I was called upon to have a funeral, and I tottered on the edge of the grave while conducting the service, not knowing but what I would tumble in myself into the grave. Finally, in deep discouragement, he decided to quit the ministry, even though he was a highly successful minister. But one day he took a long walk in the woods and came upon a camp meeting. A black gospel quartet was singing a song which had this for chorus. Nothing is too hard for Jesus. No man can work like him. Well, that educated, cultured preacher fell on his knees there among the pine trees and said, Lord, if nothing is too hard for thee, then thou canst deliver me. Deliver me now, Lord. And he knelt and gave himself over to the Lord and was instantaneously and perfectly delivered. He lived about thirty-six years after that and worked so hard that he put everyone around him to shame. The great God Almighty had done something for him, had come into his life and transformed him, because he dared to believe. Do you see how the attributes of God are not ivory-towered theology that only scholars can get a hold of, but truths for you and me? What's your trouble? Got a mean wife you can't live with, or a mean husband that treats you like a dog? Nothing is too hard for Jesus. Got a boss at work who is so hard on you that you're afraid you will have a nervous breakdown? God can handle that boss. Got a temper you can't control. God will take care of that if you let him. There isn't anything God can't handle. There isn't a situation that God can't take care of. Nothing is too hard for Jesus, and no man can work like him. His is an effortless power, because effort means I'm expending energy. But when God works, he doesn't expend energy. He is energy. With effortless power, God did and is doing his redeeming work. We stand in awe and speak in hushed tones of his incarnation. How could it be that the great God Almighty could be conceived in the womb of a virgin? I don't know how it could be, but I know that the great God who is omnipotent, the great God Almighty, could do it if he wanted to. The incarnation was easy for God. It may be hard for us to understand, a mystery of godliness, but it is not hard for God. And what about the atonement? Jesus died in the darkness on that cross to save the whole world. Don't try to understand it, you can't. I know more about how the blood of Jesus Christ can atone for sin than I know what God's nature is like. I only know it does. I only know that I'm reconciled to God through the blood of the Lamb. That's all I know, and that's enough. I also know that God raised his son from the dead. I don't know how, but I know he could do that. And I know God can raise you from the dead. Have you ever stopped to think about the resurrection? What a hard thing it is to think about, all those people that died generations ago. How is God going to find all that dust? I don't know. But I don't have to know. I put my hand in God's hand, and he says, You just come along and keep happy, and I'll take care of everything. I can make creation, and I can keep it, and I can bring about incarnation, and I can bring about atonement, and I can bring about resurrection. And I can bring about your resurrection. So I'm not worrying. I can't visualize my resurrection, but I can believe it. Amen. And so it is with forgiveness and cleansing from sin and the breaking of habits. That ugly sin that has been on you so long, you hate it so bad it's been there so long you wish you were free. But you just don't have the courage to believe. 
I appeal to you, dare to believe, that the Lord God Omnipotent lives, and with him 